Um, I'm Dan Dreher and I live in Maine and I've been researching the truth uh, about Bigfoot for about 12 years. I'm not perhaps a standard researcher where I, I don't howl, I don't tree knock, um, I don't wear camo, but that's okay, you know. My goal is the truth of existence or non-existence because either way, that would be okay with me. It's just the truth I'm after. And that seems to be a very elusive thing. And so I decided to kind of go after it myself. I got into it by accident, actually. I was just wondering what happened to this creature. You know, if anything from science or anything discovered it. It was kind of on the tail of getting a book when I was 13 years old from my parents for a birthday present. And it was Legend Comes to Life. It was uh, Ivan T. Sanderson's Abominable Snowman book. And it was a big 530 pages or whatever. And so I read that and then went on with life. And then, you know, 12 years ago, I'm going, whatever happened to Bigfoot? And so I've been here ever since. And my goal is how to discover it, how to get to the truth, what's the best way to go. And I've seen a lot of avenues that people have taken. I've seen, you know, um, paranormal ways to look at it. I've seen physical ways to look at it, uh, footprint casts and all this other stuff, which I thought was proof. Only to find out that audio, photos, YouTube, documentaries, conferences, there's no proof there. And so people walk away with very little more than what they had when they walked in, or maybe what they didn't have when they walked in. And so uh, a little while ago, I got into this uh, idea about DNA. Um, and maybe that's a way forward because it, it's physical evidence. So DNA and I have developed quite a partnership. I've learned a lot about it. I got into studying it. Um, I spent about four years just immersed in the technology, immersed in the science, reading papers and learning different things. One of the things that got me going uh, in that direction in a stronger way was uh, watching a documentary put on by National Geo, uh, where a guy named Mark Evans from the UK, who is a you know, a kind of a wildlife, you know, researcher guy, you know, invest, you know. And he um, put together a team of eight scientists who went to Bhutan and they took an, a portable DNA sequencer with them to look for the Yeti. And they found footprints in snow and they sampled the footprints for the Yeti and it turned out to be bare. But the point was that they were able to get DNA from snow prints. And so I set up my truck and I put together a DNA collection kit, sterilized everything and made sure that my DNA wasn't in anything. And I put it in the truck and I set up the truck for sleeping and I would go winter camping for two or three years. I went winter camping whenever I could, looking for a trackway to sample. And that kind of went by the wayside. I didn't see a trackway anywhere. But the DNA idea stuck with me and I watched it progress into the potential of maybe collecting water samples from, from the land watershed around a, a pond or um, a creek or a river and I thought about that. And then uh, I kind of got wind of this guy in Texas who was doing water samples uh, in Oklahoma of DNA after his first sighting at 78 years old. And his results are astounding. But in the process of emailing him and staying in touch with him for five years, I ran across another study, which was done in two zoos in Europe, one in the UK, one in Copenhagen, Denmark. And they were setting up fans inside these zoos as a proof of concept to see if they could collect DNA from the air. So they set up these fans, these little computer fans with filters, and they ran them for 24 hours. And some of them, they only ran for an hour. Um, and each T 
team got all the animal DNA in the air from their zoo animals and from some animals outside the zoo. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, wow, this is amazing. And uh, so I started looking into that as a new technology. Number one, it's cheap. Um, number two, um, the filters are dry because they're on the backs of fans. So you're pulling air through the back of the fan and the filter being dry will last in a, in a clean storage you know, container for up to eight months. So you don't need to like rush it to the lab like you would have to with a water sample or something like that. And that just appealed to me. So I got fans and you know filter material, which is really just air conditioner material, and uh, sterilized the material in a 50-50 bleach bath, rinsed it in distilled water, dried it, folded it up and put it into a clean baggie. And today, uh, yesterday actually, um, was my first day deploying the technology and I was really excited. And so I ran the fans yesterday afternoon, uh, about three o'clock, and I got up at 5.30 this morning. I'm in a remote area for one thing, um, uh, in Maine, and uh, it's really quiet, it's really great. I love it being here. Um, but um, I shut the fans off at 5.30 this morning because there was some showers coming and I was worried about my filters getting wet. And so today, it had some showers and uh, but then it cleared out and I put the fans out again. Um, yesterday the wind was blowing from the west so I made sure that the wind was blowing onto the backs of the fans from the west. Today the wind has shifted light to the south so today I turned the fans around so that they could catch the south wind through the back and through the filter and uh, they're still running you know they're basically just fans running on batteries. Now you can feel that the wind is very light um, on your face here. Um, if I was to turn around and go in the other direction, I probably wouldn't feel any wind at all because it's just not blowing from there. So I decided to find a nice quiet spot. where I knew nobody would be around and nobody would be behind the fan because you don't really want to pick up more human DNA than you would expect. Um, the whole thing about human DNA is we don't have the mutations that the, that the researcher, the PhD chemist in Texas, got from his samples, his water samples. He got 18 mutations in a very short DNA sequence. His DNA matched 100% to the human genome reference. My DNA would also match 100%, and most every human would. The fact that he got 18 mutations in, hum in a human genome far, far away from any of the great apes is really an important discovery. And I think more people ought to try to get their minds around that. Anyway, so the fan's been running, it's still running. I'm on the same set of batteries that I started out with yesterday. And there it is, $30 for the fan. I've got about a dollar in material on the back and that's been catching DNA for, I don't know, 24 hours. So what I can do now, and I feel comfortable doing this, is I can turn it off. There. So what I'll do is I'll very carefully unclip the filter I'll very carefully unclip the filter and fold it on itself, fold it into quarters and fold it again and put it into a sterile container and find a lab to, to test it. And the investment in the fan is great because 
you can just keep using them and using them and using them. And all you need to do is put a dollar's worth of filter material on the back and collect DNA for 24 hours and you can send it off. And it's dry, so it'll last for eight months. The target sequence of 220 nucleotides in the DNA, the target sequence for vertebrates has a one base pair difference between us and Neanderthals. The mutations that the chemist in Texas found have 19 differences, but it is far, far away from any of the great apes. So this is why he's saying is a human-like primate. It doesn't prove Sasquatch, but it's a human-like primate. Okay. One of the important reasons for doing this is to support the findings of the chemist in Texas of the mutations that he had discovered in his DNA. He actually did a second round of sampling and got the same mutations plus a new one. Five of those mutations also were discovered in samples taken out of the Talladega National Forest in Alabama. So as long as people can do this and keep adding keep adding to the evidence, keep adding to the data, because science wants repeatable results. So if you can keep repeating results like this, where you get a human genome that has mutations that do not belong to us or are very rare in us, then the chances of maybe science finally taking a look at it is a very real possibility. Dr. Haskell Hart, he is retired. He's uh, in his 80, early 80s. He has supported financially uh, DNA studies in the past. He is a uh, graduate from Harvard. He taught for 10 years as a chemistry professor. And then for 20 years, he went to Shell Oil as a chemical analyst and then retired. But the whole time he followed the cryptozoology subject, especially with Bigfoot. And at 78 years old, he saw his first one, which is what motivated him to take water samples from the area that he's had his encounter. And the, the results in those samples are mutations that are rare, unusual, and non-human. So this has been nothing but motivating for me to learn about. And uh, he's just been, he's my rock star. He's been great.